Testing, testing. Okay, first announcement. Um, we're live streaming this in Lorenzo B, so um, you can go there. Uh, second announcement. This track is sponsored by Canonical. Canonical supports Ubuntu, the most popular cloud and desktop Linux distribution. And I'd like to introduce Phil Dubowitz. He's one of the founders of SoCal Linux Expo. He's going to be talking about scaling systems configuration at Facebook. At least I will if I can get my mic to stay on. All right, guys, welcome. <coughs> Good morning. So uh, this morning I want to talk about uh, scaling con systems configuration management. And uh, so it turns out that there's uh, lots of different kinds of scale. And I want to talk about those different kinds of scale. And I want to talk about how you look and measure those different kinds of scale and what needs go into meeting those kinds of scale and how you take that information. Um, and you use it to measure different tools. And you can help. You can use that to decide which configuration management system is going to work best for you. And for the last year and a half at Facebook, we've been doing exactly that. Uh, we are in the process of retiring our very ancient CF Engine 2 system uh, and moving to something else. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. But if I'm going to talk to you about scale and I'm going to talk to you about system configuration management, the question is, who am I and why am I qualified to talk to you about these things? And so when I'm at a conference and some guy stands up and starts talking about stuff, the question I always have is, well, why the hell should I listen to you? <coughs> so this is the slide where you get to decide if you want to stay here or if you want to leave. Uh, so I have configuration management <coughs> experience. Uh, several jobs ago, I worked at Ticketmaster, where we wrote a system called Spine. It was response to CF Engine 2, uh, because we wanted partial configuration, and we wanted templating, and we wanted a lot of things that CF Engine 2 was not going to provide us. Uh, and so we wrote this system called Spine, uh, and it is open sourced. Uh, and this was in the days before Puppet and Chef. And I also wrote a system called Provision, which was the complement to Spline. Uh, it would provision DNS and filer space and uh, make VMs and do all the things that you needed to do in order to have a system that could run a configuration management system. <coughs> uh, I also have some experience with scale, just a little bit. Uh, at Ticketmaster, when I left, we had, were pushing, I think, 6,000 systems. Uh, I worked at Google for a while, um, and you might know that they have one or two systems. Um, and now I work at Facebook, where we also have an incredibly large number of systems. Uh, and I will talk about that number <coughs> in some detail later. So, scale. We have to talk about what scale means in order to have some understanding of how we want to meet that scale and where our configuration management system is going to fit. In order to do that, you have to ask yourself a couple of different questions. The first question you might ask yourself is, <coughs> how many homogenous systems can you maintain or do you need to maintain? And if what you have is a huge number of absolutely identical systems, or at least systems you want to be absolutely identical, uh, you have a very specific kind of problem you need to solve. And there's a lot of tools out there that solve this problem. You may be able to get away with something as simple as using rsync or rdisk. Uh, and in fact, IBM made a uh, beautiful suite of tools called XCAT, which is specifically designed for keeping HPC style clusters running and identical. Um, and scaling a, sit, um, a system uh, that's like this is a pretty unique problem. Um, and if that's what you want to do, you need to be gearing towards that kind of problem. Another question you may ask yourself is, how many heterogeneous systems do I want to maintain? And if that's what you want to do, it's an entirely different problem. And in fact, I imagine that that's what the vast majority of people in this room um, actually want to do. You have mail servers and DNS servers and cache servers and database servers. And what's more is that within each one of those categories, you probably don't have a bunch of machines that are identical. You probably have the database servers that look kind of like this, and the database servers that look kind of like that. And you have the web servers that are internal and web servers that are external, and your internal DNS servers, and, and the one-off web server for the dude who's doing the random thing. And <coughs> right? So, so we, we maintain not only heterogeneous groups of systems, but heterogeneous systems within those heterogeneous groups of systems. You also may need to ask yourself how many people are needed. Um, and we're going to talk a lot about sort of how this plays in with different systems. Um, but the way in which you manage your configuration is going to determine how many people are needed, not just globally, but within different subsets and the people who are going to manage core configuration versus maybe things that people are going to manage other things. Which leads us into the final question, which is can you safely delegate Delta configuration? And what do we mean by that? By that I mean, well, you kind of know how you want your systems to, ma to be maintained, but maybe there's a dude who runs an app on five systems, and he knows that there's something more specific, and you want to let him deal with that, but you don't want to have him maybe changing how your database servers are run. So what's our goal? <coughs> we have to have a goal. At Facebook, our goal was to have 
roughly four people who could manage the core way in which we would manage our systems configuration. Uh, we wanted to have those people be able to manage a configuration system that would manage tens and tens and tens of thousands of systems and just have four people, and that's it. And then have all of the service owners and engineers who care about specific subsets of configs and specific subsets of machines be able to manage that crap themselves. Well, now we have a goal. Let's figure out what we need to meet that goal. And there's three things we need. First piece we need is some basic scalable building blocks. Building blocks are fun. We played with them in kindergarten. Um, so we want those. And the first one we need is distribution. It's whatever system we pick has to be distributed. Um, so whether you have five systems in your application or web server, or you have 5,000, or you have 500,000, it doesn't matter. The reality of it is you're going to probably grow. Like That's usually the goal. And when you add another five, or 50, or 100, you can have two problems, or you can have one problem. Your one problem can be, how am I scaling my application, or my service, or my website, or whatever. Um, or you can look at it and say, well, how do I scale that thing? But then also, I have this one system that's doing all my configuration management calculations. So like, do now I got to figure out if I can scale that. And like, we don't want to be in that position. If everything that's possible is done on the client, then as you scale your application, and as you scale your website, you're automatically scaling your configuration management system. It's one less problem you need to deal with. It's got to be deterministic. Um, when your configuration management system runs, regardless of what you pick, you want to know that when you run it and it succeeds, it doesn't exit with some error, that you have the system you want. You're dictating, I need this configuration, I need all of these things. You're expressing some state that you want to be the state of the world. And when you're done with that run, when that software exits, you want to have that system. Eventual consistency is not what we want in this situation. I don't want to kickstart a system. And then like, you know, 20, 30 minutes later, it may have done enough runs to get where I want it to get. I want to know that when this is finished, I have the system I want. It's got to be idempotent. Um, and fortunately for us, most systems strive for idempotency these days. Um, and what that means is we only get the changes that are necessary. Uh, it's got to be safe to run this over and over and over again. I don't want to run something, have it start a service, and then run it again and have it stop a service. That would suck. Um, so uh, as it turns out that um, item potency is not just useful because you may accidentally run it again, but it's also useful because you probably are going to want to run this over and over again to push out configurations. Uh, at Facebook, we run our configuration management system uh, at every 15 minutes, and if it wasn't safe to run over and over again, Facebook would never be up. It's got to be extensible. Uh, <coughs> at Facebook, being a large company, we have a large number of internal systems that we need to tie things into. But that doesn't just apply to us. I've worked at dot coms with seven people, and I've worked at large companies, and the reality of it is everywhere I've worked has had some sort of internal system that would have been really useful to tie my configuration management system into, whether that be as simple as Nagios or as complicated as you know a homegrown um, inventory management system. It doesn't matter. The point is, is you almost always have something internal that you would like to be able to tie things into, and you can either hack around this, or you can have a system that's extensible enough that it's easy to tie these things into. And finally, it's got to be flexible. Um, if, if it has to dictate a workflow to you, you're either not going to use the tool, you're not going to use the tool well, or you're constantly going to be working around the tool. Um, so at Facebook, we have all sorts of funky uh, workflow issues, or not issues, but like uh, paradigms. So we push code twice a day, every day. It makes us able to move incredibly fast. We do code reviews before we commit code, um, which is really useful, but also not that common. And those are just two examples. The reality of it is every one of you works somewhere that has a workflow. And that workflow already works for you. And so why would you pick a tool that's going to come and be like, no, 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 dude, you're doing it all wrong. Let's do it some other way. Um, you want a tool that's going to adapt to you, not a tool that makes you adapt to it. The second thing we want is configuration is data. And this, this, is, this is a phrase that, sort of we turn, we, that we came up with. And what does it mean? Well, service owners know things like, I want more shared memory. Like, I'm running Oracle, or I'm running Postgres, or MySQL, and I need more shared memory. Or they may know things like, I need a certain kind of VIP, or I want my core files to be over there instead of over here, right? They know the end result of what it is they want. But what they don't know is how to configure a DSR VIP, or um, just because they know they want core files in one place doesn't mean they know which sys control setting, what the sys control setting for local port range needs to be, or what LDAP server needs to point to, or any of a variety of other configuration settings. What they do know is the end result. And so if you can have data structures that represent the final state of what it is that the system is going to look like, that people can manipulate, 
as hashes or arrays or, or whatever the appropriate data structure is. Everyone knows how to iterate an array or add an entry to a hash. And so if you can express your configuration as simple configuration data, then people can change that in various different configurations. And at the very end, you can take this data and convert it into actual configuration, whether that be configuration files, starting and stopping services, installing packages, it doesn't matter. Right? We want to be able to express this as data because data is simple and abstract. The third thing we need is flexibility. And we've talked about flexibility a little bit already. Um, we talked about it in the sense of a tool that will adapt to your workflow. But there's other pieces of flexibility. Um, super fast prototyping is incredibly useful. Um, there's this joke in our industry that I'm sure many of you have heard that people come to us and they want things yesterday. Every one of you has had someone come along and say, I need this thing. When do you need it? Oh, I need it yesterday. Well, at Facebook, we run into this all the time. And in fact, it is not uncommon for people to be like, OK, so I really need this change. and need it across the entire fleet. And they need it like before launch. And they're like, OK, that's cool. Uh, so Facebook moves incredibly fast. But the reality of it is that we're not some special snowflake exception in this, in, in this, ran in this realm. Um, and while you may not necessarily push things across your fleet in an hour, the ability to build what it is, that the change that you need really super fast, and then go start testing it, the faster you can build that change, the more time you have to test, the more time you have to see that, the more time you have to see that that may screw up everything, the more time you have to see whether that's going to be the awesomest thing ever, and the more time you have to push it out. But if it takes you two days to build it, you have less time to test, you have less time to to push it out, you have less time to do everything. So you want something where you can build all of these changes and model them super quick. Uh, we wanted a tool where internal assumptions of this tool were going to be easy to change. And this is super crazy, right? This is one of those places where you don't think about this kind of stuff because when you go to pick a tool, you're ideally going to pick a tool where all of the internal assumptions of this tool map to the internal assumptions of your organization. And obviously, that's the goal, right? You want to pick something that's going to map pretty well to your organization. However, no matter what tool you pick, and, and I really mean that across the board, you're going to run into a case where like, you know, a month, a year, two years, five years down the line, you run into this place where you're like, I need to do this crazy thing. And it violates all of the, the internal assumptions of this tool, or this core assumption of the tool. And we wanted to be able to, when up against a fence like this, have a nice way to go in and change the internal assumptions of the tool. And finally, we wanted ways to extend it easily. As it turns out, uh, software is never finished. Um, you've probably heard that before. And so there's going to be a feature that you're going to want that the authors never thought of, or you never thought of, or no one's ever had the time to build, or whatever. So let's look at an example of how we would want to, uh, sort of at an abstract level, build something that's this flexible. Let's say that we're not managing syscontrols on our box. Let's say we're just using the defaults. Then we come along and we're like, hey, I'm going to templatize syscontrol.com. I want something super simple and easy. And in the process, what I want, the way I want to do this at a theoretical level is to do something really early on where I can calculate all of the defaults that I should probably apply to the vast majority of people who are going to be running my system. Or are going to be running, or are going to be running on our system. And we're going to shove those into a big hash. Hashes are simple. And then all of the configuration that people might want to run are going to run. Database configuration and body body blah. And during this process, based on the configuration that they're trying to um, they're trying to roll out, they can tweak they need to. They can go, oh, I'm an Oracle box. Let me like do crazy ass shit or you know whatever it is you need to do. And all they're doing is changing a hash, and they've not changed anything on the system. And then what I want to happen is at the very end of this, everyone's had their chance to chance to touch all their little things. I want to take this data structure and I want to build syscontrol.conf. And if it's changed, I want to reload syscontrols. So this is the kind of flexibility we were aiming for. So we had the three things we needed. And now it was time to sit down and pick a tool. And we looked at lots and lots and lots of tools. Um, and we did not look at the tools that were 100% proprietary. Um, we just didn't want to. We wanted to look at tools that were preferably 100% open source or very, very close. And when we looked at all sorts of things, and the only thing that's on this page that we didn't look at is salt because it didn't exist at the time. Um, <coughs> but I wanted to mention it because it does exist now. Uh, so we looked at all these tools at a very high level. We looked at the docs and we looked at examples. And, and what we found was that there were three tools out there that seemed probably likely to meet our needs. And we took those three and we decided to do a deep dive on them and start building configuration and trying to see how it would look in an environment. And could we make it bend the to, to our will? And the three we picked were Spine, Puppet, and Chat. 
Spine was kind of an obvious choice because I was basically the lead developer at Ticketmaster, and so, well, we had a great resource. Uh, the downside there is that it was super stale. No one had touched it since I left Ticketmaster, so it was about three years stale. Uh, it had made a whole bunch of Red Hat-specific assumptions. It, was, it had its limitations. And also, there was no community, right? Like, I can't hire one of you and be like, so do you have a Spine experience? Because most of you in here haven't heard of it. Uh, Puppet seemed pretty awesome. It had lots of abstractions. It was uh, really mature. has lots and lots and lots of manifests out there that people have written. Hiring people for it is super simple. Chef has very similar things. It's very abstract. There's a huge community around it. Tons of cookbooks out there. So these three seem to uh, to have their pros and cons, but they had likelihood of meeting our three needs that we talked about. Um, we did briefly look, as I said, about the other ones. These three were the ones that sort of rose to the top in a brief look and that we, we did a deeper look into. Well, we picked Chef, um, which those of you who have been paying attention to the news probably saw the announcement a couple weeks ago. Um, and every one of you here has a favorite tool. And if I asked you, you could give me 110 reasons why that is the coolest tool on the planet. And I am not going to sit here and tell you why Chef is the coolest tool on the planet. Um, if I just sit here and gripe about Chef, like, you'll all leave. Um, and while I do love Chef, uh, the goal here is to talk about how we measure scale and how we use that to pick a tool. And so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to talk about problems we, we saw with Chef, things where we were like, well, this may not meet our needs, and how we were able to solve that with Chef and why those met our scalability needs. And then you can take this and you can measure it against all of the tools out there and pick what's best for you. The first problem we ran into is the node save problem. And for those of you who are not familiar with Chef, the way Chef works is it starts up and it runs a program called OHI. And for those of you who are puppet people, this is the equivalent of Factor. And what OHI does is it, it says, oh, hi, I'm going to go look at your stuff. And it looks at hardware and it looks at software and it looks at your, your file systems and your, your mounts and, and all of this stuff. And it builds a huge hash of, of introspective data, just as introspection and like here's the current state of the system. Because what you need is the current state of the system and the desired state of the system, and then you need to figure out how to go from A to B. So you've got to start somewhere, and you start with the current state of the system. So a high runs, and it builds this big hash of data. Then, and I'm going to gloss over some details here, uh, we run all of our cookbooks, all of our configuration that we care about. Um, and during that process, we build even more data. We build the data about how long it took to run, how many cookbooks, which cookbooks we ran, how many resources were updated, if we had any exceptions, whether it was successful, blah, blah, blah. So now we have this huge ton of data. And the very last thing it does is called node.save. And uh, that data is part of this node object. And there's a method on this object called save. And when it calls this method, it takes all this data and it shoves it all up to the server. And for most places, this is super awesome because what you now have is an inventory management system for free. And that's pretty cool. Um, but it turns out that uh, Facebook has been around a while, and we have our own inventory management system. Um, and we also have internal systems that group nodes and tell us kind of what they're supposed to be doing and all that sort of stuff. So we didn't really need this feature. And what's worse is we have really big clusters, like 10 to 15,000 nodes. And we want to run Chef every 15 minutes. And so if you take 10 or 15,000 nodes, and you take a couple of megabytes of data, every 15 minutes and shove it over the network, you will melt your switches. And if you don't melt your switches, then you have no bandwidth left for all the cat videos everyone wants to watch on Facebook. Um, so this was clearly not going to fly for us. So sit down and you're like, oh, well, how, are we gonna, how could we potentially solve this problem if Chef was the tool we picked? And the standard solutions in the documentation was to take OHI and start disabling plugins. I don't need to know about file systems. I don't need to know about users. I don't need to know about my kernel version or my modules that are loaded and all this stuff. And like, I was looking at that and I was like, well, that sucks. Like, frankly, that's just a horrible solution. Because A, I really would like that data. I don't want to limit the tool. Um, and B, even if I stripped it down to the bare minimum of data I would need to make the decisions I want to make, it's still going to be too much data to shove from that many nodes across the network that often. So what I really wanted was all of the OHI data and then I just don't want to send it to the server, right? Like, that's ultimately what we wanted. And so we kind of thought about, well, how can we do this? Do we re-architect Chef? Do we, like, give up on Chef altogether? Do we patch it? Do we fork it? Do we pay Opscode to go build a new feature for us? Well, we sat down uh, with Opscode, and we said, look, this kind of sucks. And they said, yeah, it's, it's kind of an interesting problem. And so uh, they wrote, uh, we wrote together a cookbook called Whitelist Node Adders. And what it does is, uh, it 
it, so cookbooks, as I said, are the configuration for Chef. And because it's Ruby, you can reopen core classes. And they reopen the save method. Well, they saved it off to the side. And they reopen the save method. And then they just stripped out everything that wasn't in a whitelist. And they made an API so you could tweak this whitelist. And at the very end, they just call the original node save. And so what happens is we delete all the data we don't want to save to the server, and then we call node save and, and save that back to the server. And what it turns out is in our environment, we save less than a kilobyte per machine back to the server. And in true open source fashion, you can go get the code. But what's really interesting about this is that this is the code. And that's like five lines. Now, I'm cheating here slightly because there's a filter function that is not on the screen. And that filter function is a, is a small loop that walks this hash. It's not terribly complicated. But ultimately, the change that went into this is like five lines to take the four internal hashes that the node object has and call filter on them, and then call the original save function. And so what that is is flexible. That is super flexible. Now. I know there's a couple of programmers in here who are going, oh my god, monkey patching the core code from a configuration, that's horrible and evil, and you're kind of right. Um, however, it's a useful hammer to have. I'm not recommending you change the internals of Chef to configure your Apache box, I'm really not. However, there's going to be a time when you're going to be up against a wall and you're going to have this really big nail, and having a super huge hammer to hit that nail with is really awesome. The next problem we ran into was the uh, method missing problem. And uh, Adam, who was the original author of Chef, will tell you that, uh, that, that this is one of the things he really, truly hated ever happened. Um, so the method missing, method, method, that's fun to say, method missing problem. The method missing problem is interesting. And in order to discuss the method missing problem, I need to tell you a little bit about some of the features in Chef. Because basically, it's a wonky interaction of two cool features. The first feature is auto-vivification. And for those of you who are not computer science people, auto-vivification is a feature found, as far as I know, only in Perl, uh, where you can reference some nested element of a hash where the parents don't exist. And that's cool. We'll just make that shit for you. Um, and that's really, really nice, particularly in a configuration management system where what you want to do is deal with data. You have a, a structure that you understand should be there, and so you just want to add an entry somewhere below and you don't have to sit there and go, well, did someone initialize this? Well, did someone initialize this? Well, did someone initialize this? So that seemed like a great idea. <coughs> and at the same time, what, what they wanted to do was say, well, we want to be pretty flexible with syntax because not everyone who's going to use this is going to be a programmer. So like, while Ruby is totally available to you, we want to have some syntactic sugar so you can kind of do things in a bunch of different ways and it'll kind of mostly work. And so when you, when you access data on the node object, i.e. attributes, uh, you can use the bracket syntax as if it was just a hash. You can use the dot syntax as if you were using setters and getters. And it doesn't matter. Like, Chef will figure this shit out for you. So it turns out these interact in kind of a funky way. Let's say you call node.foo uh, parenthesis bar. So what Ruby's going to do in this case is it's going to check to see if this node object has a foo method. And if so, it'll call that foo method and pass it the string bar. Bob's your uncle, you're done. Good. Wonderful. But let's say that it doesn't exist. Well, Ruby's going to go, yeah, that's cool. You don't have this. I'm going to throw an exception. And I'm actually glossing over some details of the internals of Ruby. If you really want to know how this works, I can tell you about it. But for the purposes of this, we're going we're gonna to simplify a bit. So Ruby throws this exception. And what Chef does is say, I'm going to catch that exception. And I'm going to go and see if there's an attribute, i.e., an element on my hash, called foo. And if so, you probably are trying to use this as a setter, so I'm going to assign it the string bar. But what if there's not a foo? Well, it's going to go, aha, auto vivification time. I know what you want. You want an entry called foo, and you want it to have a string called bar, so let me just do that for you, and it'll all be wonderful. Um, and it turns out that for certain syntaxes, that is incredibly useful, i.e., this one, or this one. And you can imagine that this could be node foo bar being baz, and having all of that magically happen for you is going to save you lots of lines of code, and that's, again, wonderful. Uh, but what happens when I call node.has key foo? And for those of you who, uh, who know Ruby, you'll know that that's not a real function. But has key question mark is a function. And has key is a function on Ruby objects that look kind of like hashes uh, that says, hey, do you have this key in your hash? And it turns out that there's an idiomatic uh, naming convention in Ruby that says, well, if you're going to return a Boolean, you should have a question mark at the end of your function. <coughs> As some guide to the people who might call this function to know what kind of a function it is. Now, let's say that you're writing along and you're like, hey, I want to know if this has foo. So if no dot has key foo. Well, what happens if you forget that question mark? 
that comes along and goes, ah, I know what you meant. You want has key to be an element in your hash, and you want it to have value foo. And so let me go ahead and return that to you. And do you know what an object value it's to? Well, it's not nil, and it's not false. So what it is is true. And so your if node has key is always true, which is <laughs> definitely not what you want. Um, and so I, I ran into this problem, and, and, and Casey in the background has this problem, and Ender and Larry, and all the people on my team have run into this problem. Uh, and it's really, really obnoxious when you write some code and you test it on one box where it happens to be true and you know it happens to be true and then you roll it out and then all of a sudden you change everything everywhere. That sucks. Uh, so <laughs> I was like, so I called up Adam and I was like, dude, that really sucks. And he's like, I know, I really hate that. We need to change that at some point. And so I will tell you that Chef 11, which came out this month, does not have this feature. Uh, however, we were not willing to wait till February, last February, to get this uh, to get this change in behavior. And so I had seen whitelist node adders, and I thought, aha, I can fix this. And with one line, I did. So I reopened chef node's method missing, which is how this exception gets raised. And I looked deep into Ruby, and I thought, ah, it, it just sends the method to an object. I, I can figure this out. And so I literally just put in the original code that Ruby would have ordinarily done, and I dropped the entire um, logic there that chef internally does. And so I got the original Ruby behavior back with one line of code. What was even better about that was that because it's the method missing object, I did not kill auto vivification. I still have auto vivification if you use the bracket syntax, because it's the bracket operator. So I only broke this feature in the one place I wanted to break this feature, which is really super useful, and I did it in one line of code. So again, I'm not recommending you monkey patch the internals of whatever tool you pick just for willy nilly, because uh, things will get super crazy. But sometimes you really, really want to change the behavior of a tool, and the ability to do it trivially, well, I don't know if it's trivial, but easily, um, is really, really useful. So again, very, very flexible. So those are the two sort of crazy examples I wanted to give about <coughs> sort of what, what I meant by those examples and, and what we wanted. That said, let's look at a little bit about the desired workflow we wanted. We wanted to provide an API for anyone, anywhere, and by anyone I mean service owners, engineers, whatever, and when I say anywhere I mean in any config, to be able to change the configuration that's going to be on their system simply by tweaking data structures. Simple data structures. We're not talking binary trees here, we're talking hashes and arrays. And we wanted engineers to not have to understand what they're building on in order to do this. We don't want them to have to understand how the hash is going to get generated into a into whatever config file, or how that array is going to make uh, a host an Etsy host or EtsyResolve.com, or how it's going to generate uh, network configs or restart services or whatever. We want them to just be able to specify the state of the system in simple configuration files and not have to worry about all the other configuration that's there. We wanted engineers to be able to change systems without having to worry about all the other systems. So if you're responsible for our web servers, we wanted you to be able to say, well, we need this tweak. Um, because we're working around this or we want this performance and not have to worry about, oh my god, are all the database servers going to crash because MySQL can't handle that. So this is kind of what we wanted. Uh, testing had to be super, super easy. And it turns out that if testing is not easy, people don't test. Turns out. Well, you can force tests, but then people's tests become shitty. <laughs> if you force them hard enough, then you just get people who don't make changes at all and they assign tickets to you and ask you to make the change. So all of these were not going to be acceptable options. We had to make testing easy. And then there's one other thing we had to do. This is a little bit different. This is where this talk is going to diverge pretty strongly from any other configuration management system talk I imagine you'll see. I wanted to move item potency up. And you're all going, what the hell does that mean? And the reason you're all going, what the hell does that mean is because I made up this term, because I don't know what to call it. Uh, so let's talk about what that means. <coughs> Most configuration management systems deal with records. I can manage a cron job. I can manage a user. I can manage a host entry. I can manage a name server entry in resolve.com. You're always dealing with a specific record. And it turns out that so you add a cron job entry, and then you're like, dude, I don't need this cron job entry anymore, which means that when you delete it, you're, because it only understands records, you've deleted it and it doesn't know what's managing this record anymore and it just stays stale and that sucks. But imagine if you, were m if you were actually treating the entirety of all cron jobs as one item potent system. And so if you didn't know about an entry, then it's not supposed to be there. And if you do know about it, then it's supposed to be there. So when you remove a cron entry or sys control or a host entry, it goes away. And what this looks like in reality is, and this is some chef code, 
let's say you have a cron job and a user that you're managing. This is a paradigm that you'll see in Puppet and in, in, in Chef and in all sorts of things where you change the action to delete because it's no longer needed. And then you put this stupid comment on the top that says, hey, if you happen to see this after March 1st, like, it's not going to be necessary anymore and you should delete it. And you know what that is? That's cross. It's crap. It's technical debt and you don't want it because no one's going to fucking clean that up. You know what's really awesome, though? This. Just deleting it. Now, it turns out you can't do this in Chef. Well, not with these resources. Uh, Chef does records just like everything else. But that's what I want. We want a system where I can just delete the crap I don't want and it goes away. So let's look at how we did this with some case studies. The first case study, as you might imagine, is syscontrol. And the reason I keep talking about syscontrol is because in the CF Engine two days of, of, of Facebook, it was incredibly painful. We had 157 different copies of syscontrol.com. And the way they came about was some dude had some system and he was like, well, I want to change where core files are, so let me copy the one from the web servers or copy the default and change my one line. And now, you know, the other 250 lines or whatever in that file are instantly stale. And so someone comes along and says, well, our, you know, hardware profiles changed or we rolled out a new kernel, let's change the defaults. And so it goes into the default file and changes a bunch of things. And they can't change all the other files because they don't know if those lines in those other files are defaults because they've copied that file or if they were set there by somebody. You have no idea. So you just crew just tons and tons of crust. And so trying to make any sense of our syscontrol configurations was just a complete and utter nightmare. So this is one of the first places I was really excited to change this. So we built uh, a, a syscontrol cookbook. And for those of you who don't know about Chef, there's a couple basic pieces to every cookbook. And one of them is attributes, where you define some data early on. And so we looked at hardware introspection. We looked at all of this data that Ohai gave us, amount of RAM, number of CPUs, body, body, blah. Built a huge hash of defaults of all of this data. and then. In a recipe, which is where you define the resources you want to manage, we said, hey, we want to manage a file, and we want that file to be called etc6control.conf, and dude, here's a template that you should run to figure out how to generate that file. And then we actually wrote that template. Um, and the piece I'm leaving off here is that there's also a little bit of configuration that says, if it changes, you should run syscuddle and blah, blah, blah. So let's look at this template. This template is three lines. And for those of you who can't read Ruby, because it's a little bit backwards, uh, I'm taking a hash, I'm pulling out the keys, I'm sorting them, and then I print out a key, and then I print out the equals, and then I print out the value, and then I close my loop. It's a loop. It prints values. It looks like this, key equals value, key equals value. It's really simple. And now, I'm a database guy, or I'm a sysadmin who has to care about the databases, or whatever, and I come along and I'm like, dude, I need more shared memory on my databases, so I make a database cookbook, and I have two lines and a recipe that says, dude, I'm gonna override these two values. I don't need to care about local port ranges or where core files are or whether I'm listening to IBV6 route advertisements or any other syscontrol. All I need to know is I care about these two and I need to set them. Well, how does that help us scale? That may seem good to you or may that, may that may seem bad to you. Well, this approach gives us significantly better heterogeneity because on my database servers, my configuration becomes two lines. Now, re in reality, it's going to become more lines because I'm going to have some packages I want to install and, and, and whatever. But ultimately, the, the only thing I'm expressing in that database configuration is what's different, i.e. delta configuration. And by tri trimming down all of the configuration to only what's different on these systems, my whole configuration set of data is, is much smaller. And so it's much easier to manage a whole, num whole large number of heterogeneous systems. Um, and because of that, uh, Fewer people are needed to manage these configurations because there's just less configuration. And because there's less configuration and fewer people are needed, I can take those two lines and I can give them off to the DBAs and I can be like, dude, why don't you manage this? And that's one less thing I need to manage and that's pretty awesome. So delegation is su super simple. So let's look at a second case study, a DSR. Now unless you've worked at a big web shop, you may not know what DSR is. DSR stands for direct server return. And I, or there's a couple different, depending on which load balancer you use, they may use um, response. Um, but anyway, so the idea here is that rather than sending my request through my load balancer and then back through my load balancer, I'm going to send my request to my load balancer and the response is going to go out directly to the internet. Um, and this is really useful for streaming video. Because if you want to send a bunch of megabytes of video data um, back through your load balancer, you're going to need a lot of load balancers. Um, and generally speaking, if you're, if you're in any sort of shop where your responses are bigger than your requests, this is going to save you a so 
we wanted to look at how we can figure that. And the reality of it is, is that DSR is actually kind of hard. Uh, it requires specific load balancer configuration, specific configuration, specific network configuration. And configuring that system is non-trivial, especially if you don't understand the networking aspects of it. So if you're in a layer two network, which is the most common, you probably need a dummy interface. But if your dummy interface is already used because you have another DSR bit, now you need dummy one, dummy two, and dummy three. And if you happen to need more than three, well, now you need to go and change your mod probe settings because the default in that driver only makes three of them. And a lot of crap. You may use the loopback interface, which has its own special implications. If you're in a layer three network, you need the tunnel zero interface, depending on how you do layer three DSR. Um, and it turns out that there you don't need different interfaces, you need different sub-interfaces. So tunnel 0 colon 1, tunnel 0 colon 2. And if you want to do an IPv6 DSR VIP in a layer 3 network, you're going to use IP6 tunnel, but that doesn't you don't want to use sub-interfaces there, you want to use the IP route 2 tools and stick multiple IP addresses on there. And you're almost certainly going to need magical special routing considerations. And so if you're an engineer or a service owner and you're like, dude, I just, just, I just want a VIP, man. Uh, so I was like, dude, I want to do that for you. And so we made node.addDSRVIP. And so you call a function on the node object, and you give it an IP address. And it knows what network you're in. It knows what DSRVIPs you have. It knows all of this stuff. And it figures it out for you. So node.addDSRVIP, way better than making a bunch of files. And if you happen to be a bigger environment, where you have different clusters that maybe uh, have different configurations, now an engineer is going to have to make multiple files for all the different places they exist, and that just sucks. But being able to do this is awesome. And because it's Ruby, if I have different IP addresses with different names and different clusters, that's cool. I can have a line up on top of that that like resolves the IP address from a DNS name and shoves that in there. And so now I don't even need different configs for different clusters, because it's Ruby, and programming languages are useful. Uh, so how does this help us scale? Well, kind of the same thing as before, right? So we have fewer people. It turns out I wrote add DSR VIP, but since then I've given it off to the traffic infrastructure team. Uh, and they're the guys who manage our load balancers. So if we change how we do DSR, they're the guys who know. They're the guys who care. They're the guys who understand. So they can maintain it. There's like four or five dudes on that team, and they understand all of this crap. And so now they can manage how we do that. And when they change it, no one else needs to know. I don't need to know. You don't need to know. The service owners don't need to know. Because all they care about is that that VIP is on their machine and that it gets there in the right way in the right environment. Uh, and because there's uh, less people that need to understand that, then each one of your teams can be smaller. And your, hetero and your heterogeneity goes up because that config is tiny. It's one line. Add DSR VIP. Not, here's 47 files and a bunch of copy rolls and a bunch of commands and blah, blah, blah. And because it's one line, delegation is simple. I can give that away to every service owner and say, dude, here's a function you can call. And it turns out most engineers know how to call functions. So let's look at a couple examples, a couple other examples that are smaller. Uh, let's say you want IPv6. Well, that may sound simple enough. You either want it or you don't. But the reality of it is that uh, there are certain applications and certain environments where having IPv6 enabled in the box without an actual address may cause you problems. So you may actually want to go and remove all the modules and completely disable IPv6. And if you have IPv6 and it used to be disabled, you probably need to load modules, probably need to change two or three config files. You may need to change sys control settings and say, I want to open route advertisement. It may be super complicated. And you know what? Service owners care about N not any of that. They either want their IPv6 or they don't want their IPv6. So you have a Boolean, and like we'll figure that shit out for you. Uh, you might want to know what kind of network you're on. So we wrote a function called islayer3, and it'll uh, tell you yes or no. Um, and because of my missing method hack, if you forget the question mark, you'll get a crash instead of being always on a layer 3 network. <laughs> and if you want to add a new cron job, you have five lines because there's a hash. You just add an entry to the hash. And you know what happens if you delete the entry in this hash? Your cron job goes away. So we're going to switch directions for a moment. And we've talked a little bit about how we manage the configuration itself. Let's talk a little bit about the actual infrastructure that we built. Um, and here's where I need to give you a disclaimer. We picked Chef because it's open source. And it was really important, not just to me, but to my boss and to the company as a whole. Um, and as it turns out, Chef well, Opscode was working on all these scalability improvements when we came to them. And we talked to them about where they were and when, where these things were coming along. And one of the big things that they were working on was moving all of their um, APIs from the old Ruby-based uh, server to a new Erlang-based server, and moving the back end from CouchDB, which was not doing well, to SQL. And so their plan at the moment, they had like the, w the three you know, biggest APIs moved over in private Chef. And I should stop here and say that they have three kinds of Chef. 
uh, hosted chef, which is a service, uh, open source chef, which I think that's self-explanatory, and private chef, which was the code they used to run the service that you can go and buy. And the API is identical between all three. Um, they're just different different services on the back end. So they're like, well, <coughs> over the next year or two or some amount of time, the plan is to continue migrating everything over and eventually get rid of the Ruby server. And then once we've done that and it's baked a little while, figure out how we want to merge that back into open source and, and blah, 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 blah. And I was like, well, that kind of sucks. Um, because I really, really, really want to be able to build on what the rest of the community is doing. And I really want the rest of the community to be able to build on what we do. Um, and also, we really want these features. So we sat down and we talked to them. And uh, we, were, we worked out a way in which we could help them get uh, and test all of the changes they were making. And they could, they could finish this up in under a year and merge it into open source. And so we were talking to them about this last January. And the code drop for the entire rewrite into Erlang hit open source chef in October, I think. So it happened. Meanwhile, we needed scalability and we weren't going to wait. So since some of these changes were being baked in, in private chef, we needed private chef. And also we wanted early access to features and we wanted support contracts and blah, blah, blah. So we are also a private chef customer. That said, our biggest cluster at the moment runs open source chef. And we will continue to run open source chef to manage our production clusters. We also run private chef. Um, so I want to be really, really clear here that while we are private chef customers, we use both, and that we have production clusters that are entirely managed by open source chef, so you can do it. Disclaimer out of the way, uh, we have a bunch of customizations that we make to our chef infrastructure. Uh, we wanted our, sh our chef servers to be essentially stateless. Now, they're going to store some data, but we wanted to treat them as commodity services. We wanted to be able to reimage those systems on a moment's notice and not have to worry about backups and failover and blah, blah, blah. So we made a bunch of changes. One of the changes is we don't do search. And search is a functionality in Chef where you can say, hey, go to the server and search all the data that's on there and give me everything that has this node attribute or everything that's run Chef recently or serve anything you want. Um, and we don't use data bags, which is arbitrary hashes of data you can just shove onto the server that are not related to nodes. So these are the two things that we didn't want to do because we don't worry about, didn't want to have to worry about storing that data. And we can already get the same data from our internal systems of record. So we didn't need these features. Um, and we didn't want to do them so that we could treat the, the, the servers as, as essentially stateless. We also wanted separate failure domains. Uh, we have a lot of clusters, like a lot, a lot of clusters. And Chef dying in one of them should not affect any of the other ones. Every one of our clusters is a separate failure domain. Uh, and then finally, we use the tiered model. And in Private Chef, that's a one-line configuration that says, hey, I'm going to have stateless front ends that scale horizontally and back ends that hold data. And in Open Source Chef, this is really simple to do. It's just not one line. Basically, on your front ends, you say, I want these services. And by the way, here's where the stateful services are. And on your back end, you say, I want all my services. So totally doable in Open Source Chef, but it's a one-line config in Private Chef. Um, so we use that tiered model so that we can, we can scale our Chef infrastructure um, as we want. So with the customizations said, let's start looking at the infrastructure we have at Facebook. So at a global level, this is what it looks like. You write some code. You write cookbooks and roles and all of the magical stuff you want to write, and then you get a code review. You can't commit anything at Facebook without code review. Um, I highly recommend this model. It is the most wonderful thing in the world. Uh, you also have to pass a lint. And while these arrows are consecutive, the order doesn't matter. You have to get all of these things done. Um, and in our case, we do two kinds of lint. We use Food Critic, which is an open source piece of software that checks for chef correctness. And then we use Taylor, which is a Ruby linter. Um, and so assuming you pass all three bars, you can commit to subversion. Um, and for those of you who um, threw up in your mouth a little bit when I said subversion, don't worry, we wrap it in Git. Uh, so, as soon as you check into Subversion, all of our clusters start pulling immediately um, and make it available to the entire world. So let's zoom into one of those clusters. Well, as I said, we use the tiered model, so we have Chef backends and Chef frontends. And we have two Chef backends. One is an active backend and one is a failover. Uh, and then we have three active Chef frontends that sh spread all of the load from all of our clients that are connecting. And they have a VIP in front of them, and all of our clients connect and do Chef runs. And at the same time, we have a piece of software called Grocery Delivery, that's what it said, uh, which runs every minute on every back end, pulls from Subversion, looks at the delta between the last time it pulled Subversion and this time, and uploads all changes to its local host. And that's how we keep CocoBooks and Rolls in sync across an entire ton of clusters without having to worry about how to upload that stuff. So for those of you who know Chef really, really well, we basically don't use Knife. Like, Grocery Delivery uses Knife, but there are no accounts on our Chef servers. It doesn't work like that. Nobody in Facebook understands what Knife is. We've, we've wrapped all of this stuff. 
which means we have a bunch of assumptions. <coughs> it means that you can't do search and there's no, there's no persistence of node data. So in some Chef environments, when you start up, your old node data to some extent is reloaded from the last run. We don't have any of that. Um, which means that I have a food critic rule that checks to see if you run search and won't let you commit. Um, because it was not going to work, right? Like, if you come from another environment, you're like, dude, search, awesome. Yeah, it's not going to work here. Uh, we don't use data bags, as I mentioned. Um, and grocery delivery keeps roles in cookbooks and sync. And in fact, it runs every minute in cron. Um, and Chef only knows about the cluster it's in for obvious reasons. So the implementation details of how we did this, um, persistent data needs to come from somewhere. It's not coming from the Chef server. So OHI, we wrote OHI plugins, which again, for those of you who are not um, Chef people, is the thing that runs at the very beginning to do introspection. It contacts our service records and pulls down the data relevant to that system. So we go out and we get the information about what cluster you're in, what data center you're in, what region you're in, what groups of nodes you're in, all of that stuff. And so it's available to your entire run. And finally, the run list is forced on every run. And a run list is just the list of cookbooks that need to run in this particular system. And generally speaking, that would be on the Chef server in most Chef environments. But we don't want the Chef server to, to have any data that, that's critical. And so we just calculate this on the, on the client. And when we start the Chef run, we're like, dude, this is what I'm going to do. So let's look at some specific changes, we, uh, specific implementation details on the client. Uh, we have report handlers that feed a bunch of data into monitoring. And Casey back there uh, uh, wrote most of this and then rewrote it all as an open source script. Um, and so, uh, no, sorry, uh, we rewrote the server stuff. I'm getting ahead of myself. Anyway, so we have a report handler. And a report handler is a function that you can provide to the client that says, hey, I want to run either at the very beginning or the very end and have access to all the data and do something with it. And so we take the last exception scene, success failure, number of resources, time to run, all sorts of stuff, and we shove that into our global monitoring system. And we've actually talked about open sourcing this, but um, like literally it's all specific to our monitoring system, so it wouldn't be useful to anyone. And if we find a nice way to make that generic, we will totally do it. Um, but because we shove this all into a global mo uh, monitoring system, it means that we can graph it. And so we can graph things like number of resources changed over time. And if you think about a configuration management system, you should see spikes. Someone made a change, we change that everywhere, and the number of resources changing per run goes back down. Um, so if you all of a sudden see that number growing monotonically or growing and then staying, whatever, right, like that's bad. So we have lots and lots of useful resources. We also need to keep track of our server infrastructure, so we feed a bunch of stuff into monitoring there, and this is the open source bit. Um, so we grab stats from the Postgres server and the off server if you're running Private Chef and uh, errors from Nginx and, and, and um, Earthchef and all this stuff. And we shove that entire thing into a JSON object and we, and we spit it out. And so you can shove that into pretty much anything you want. Uh, and so Casey uh, spent some, some tireless hours over the last week taking the version we wrote that was somewhat Facebook specific and abstracting it out and making some nice scripts and, and we open source that. So now the question you're all asking yourself, and because this is a Facebook talk, is does it scale? Because Facebook's really big. So let's talk about that. That is the question. Uh, so we're big. We're really, really big. We have cluster sizes of greater than 10,000 nodes. Uh, and we do 15-minute convergence, which means 10 or some more thousand nodes um, is, is running every 15 minutes with a 14-minute display. And that's, that's a lot of chef runs. And grocery delivery runs every minute. So if you do the math there, what we're doing is we're using the Domino's philosophy. 30 minutes or less, and your change that you just checked in is everywhere in the world. Uh, and we have lots of clusters. Um, and so what do I mean by that? Well, we have a lot of clusters in every data center. We have several data centers in every region. We have several regions. So while I'm not giving you a number, I do a little bit of math. So Chef 11 comes out. Well, technically came out this month, but Chef 11 technically came out as a pre-alpha, oh my god, it'll, keep, it'll eat your babies and kill your mom, uh, sometime in November. And I was like, dude, let's see. Like, We've been working with this same code base in Private Chef for a while and, and working with the Ops Code guys. Let's see what the open source chef thing that's all nicely packaged up can do. And so we did. And uh, if you've ever seen a Facebook talk, you'll notice that typically in Facebook talks, there are no numbers. There are numbers in this one. You're welcome. Uh, so there we've got two lines here. Red is the CPU idle on the active backend, and blue is the number of nodes. 
And because not every system at, sh um, at Facebook has actually migrated to Chef yet, um, we're actually slightly below that 10,000 number, but it's 9,000. 9,000 nodes in this cluster that were all pointed to an open source Chef instance. It's a lot of nodes. So running along, and, and I installed open source Chef, and I did all the right tweaks, and I get it all running. And, and this was like steady state. And I was like, well, that's pretty cool. I can, I can scale pretty well. But let's make it better. Let's see what this thing can really do. So right around here, I deleted all those nodes. Um, and I turned off the load balancer so that nothing could talk to it. And then I t pointed two clusters all at the same Chef infrastructure. And I was like, let's, let's really see what this thing can do. And then I unleashed it all at once. And so 17,000 nodes all registered themselves in r roughly at the same time. And the CPU idle drops to like 67%, comes back up, 63%, and then starts climbing very, very quickly. And as soon as I saw it climbing very, very quickly, I was like, dude, this thing's solid. And then I reset everything back to production. So um, as you can see, this is Chef Server 11 that came out this month. And this was back when it was pre-alpha in November. So Urshef scales pretty well. Which leads me to my next graph, which is, let's look at the, so Urshef, by the way, I threw that term out there, sorry, is the rewrite of the Chef server in Erlang. So it used to be in Ruby, then it was in Erlang. And they called that Urshef um, as a way of differentiating. So let's look at the pre-Urshef builds versus the post-Urshef builds. And in order to do this, we're looking at private Chef because this all got into private Chef before it got into open source Chef. So last October, we had written all our core cookbooks. We built a team. We were super excited. We start moving our web servers. It's our biggest tiered service. And as I'm moving my first cluster, and we've got this whole team, and we're looking at the graphs, and we get to 4,000 nodes, which you'll note is not a whole cluster. And the back end was jumping up and down between like 60 to 40% CPU idle. Uh, sorry, uh, 35 to 50% CPU idle. And I was like, man, there seems to be this pattern. Every time we add another 500 systems, the drop in CPU idle is not linear. Like, that drop actually grows every time I, I throw another couple hundred systems at it. And, and, and so if we're in this range, I just don't feel comfortable throwing any more servers at it. So I called up ops code, and I was like, so that, that's not good. What are we going to do? And I said, well, you know how we moved those three API endpoints to Erlang? And I said, yeah. And they said, you know how we're trying to write move the rest of it? And I said, yeah. And they said, well, we're pretty much finished the code to move all of the rest of it to SQL plus Erlang. And I said, OK. And they said, well, we can probably get that to you next week. And I said, OK. Um, so who else is running that? Are you running it in Hosted Chef? And he goes, no, no, no one's ever run it. <laughs> and I thought about this for a minute. And I said, well, fuck it. We're Facebook. And so I did it. <laughs> and so they give me a build that has had lots and lots of unit tests, but no one's actually done anything real with. And I said, let's just install it and see what happens. It's only 4,000 nodes. What could go wrong? And so you can see there where I started the upgrade, and all of the data went away for a minute. And uh, when I was done with the upgrade, the CPU idle on the back end went to 85%. And I was like, well, now that's a market improvement. And then I added the old back end to the graph, and I noticed something truly exceptional. The old sta well, the standby back end, which is running the old software, was using more CPU with zero nodes on it than the new back end was with 4,000 nodes. That's a super impressive rewrite. It also made me really wonder if anything was actually happening. <laughs> so I waited for a day, and I made lots of changes, and my team made lots of changes, and they all went out. The thing was working. And so after a day, I finally calmed down, and I said, well, maybe you're actually doing something, and I added more nodes. And the graph changed, and I was like, wow, you really are doing something. So we moved up to 7,000 nodes, uh, and this was a relatively small cluster. And the CPU dropped to like 70, 72%. And then you'll notice it came back up to it bouncing around 79, 80%. Well, for nearly doubling the number of nodes, that's a pretty small drop in CPU. And there's something else about this graph that's kind of important. This is Private Chef. And one of the big differences in Private Chef is that there's an authentication model um, that is far more complex than the one in Open Source Chef. There's a full role-based access control model, which means that creating a client is a super expensive operation. And so that, that's this, this increase here um, is way more expensive than it would be in, in, in Open Source Chef. And the fact that it only dropped down to 70% CPU idle is super impressive. That's doing a boatload of work with relatively little uh, impact. So the thing to take away from this is that the rewrite is like scales incredibly well. 
Let's switch directions again and talk about testing. Uh, we have an expression in Facebook, which is that we don't always test our code, but when we do, we test in production, and I'm sure you've seen this on the site. So what were our testing desires? Well, we wanted to be able to take a real production host and actually test our change on it. Um, and moreover, we wanted to be able to test that change with all of the dependencies that are involved in this change. So in our CF Engine 2 days, the way we would test changes, and I use that term super loosely, is to take this policy file, SCP it out to a box, copy it into var chef inputs, chatter plus i that file, and run CF Engine. And that sucks. And that sucks for a bunch of reasons. One, if you forget to unchatter that file, now you have a box that's stale forever. Uh, two, if that, what, what, those of you who haven't used CF Engine, basically it's a big copy rule system. So you're like, hey, dude, go get this file. Um, and so you're going and getting a file from a server, and so while you can get a file to grab, at the end of the day, you're testing with only files that have been already committed. And so you're really not testing with all your dependencies, which really sucks. We didn't want to rely on people to have to clean up after themselves, like, for example, um, unchatter and muting files. Um, and as I said, it has to be easy. If it's not easy, people don't do it, or they make you do it. And neither of those are acceptable options. And finally, because we do code reviews before commit, you had to be able to test in a very valid way before you actually committed your code. So what did we do? We looked at a lot of options, and what we used was multi-tenancy. And multi-tenancy is a feature in Private Chef, which allows you to have essentially multiple logical Chef servers. And because we had bought Private Chef, this was super trivial and awesome for us. Um, but it's worth noting that you can totally build this with Open Source Chef. Uh, you'd have to do it differently, either with virtualization or some automation around building and tearing down Chef servers. But it's totally doable. Um, you could also potentially use environments, which we don't use um, at, at Facebook, and environments is a specific Chef feature. So there's a lot of different options. Um, but given our constraints, multi-tenancy made this really easy for us. Uh, and the way this works is everyone at Facebook who wants to make a chef change gets their own logical chef server, which is called an organization. And the way that actually ends up working is we wrote a little script. It's called chef test. It's actually a shell script that calls nice um, and does a few other wonky bits. Uh, and you run chef test in it. And what this is going to do is go and make you a user and an org on the test infrastructure. And that's it. And now you, now you can do chef testing. And now you go and you make your change, and you're like, well, you know, on the system, I need this package installed or whatever, and you write the code. And you run chef test, test, and you give it a server. And what this is going to do is going to take your SVN repo, which if you're an engineer at Facebook, you think is a Git repo, and it's going to shove that all up to the chef testing org. And then once all your, all your cookbooks and rules have been synced to that server, it's going to log into the server you want to test on, i.e. minus s server, and it's going to tie that to your test org for one hour. So now you log into that server and you run Chef Client. And it either makes the change you want, or it doesn't, or it crashes. And then you're like, well, I suck. And you go back and you run VI. I hope you're not running Nano. And you make the change you want to make. And then you run Chef Test Upload, which will re-upload all of your changes to the server. And then you run back into your server and you run Chef Client. And you rinse and repeat and you rinse and repeat. And when you have the behavior you want, you take some output that is evidence of that, you put it in the test plan of your diff, and you send your diff off to someone to review. And someone's going to review the code, make sure it seems sane. You're going to look at your test plan and make sure that seems sane. And then they're going to approve it, and then they're going to commit it, and then it's going to go everywhere in the world. And you can run chef test on test or revert it to production. And, and if you don't, that's cool, because an hour later we're going to come along and do it for you. So what have we learned? Well, we learned that idempotent systems are a lot better than idempotent records. This was a uh, huge lesson. Uh, we learned that delegating, uh, delegating delta configuration makes for like much, 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 much easier heterogeneity. Um, particularly at Facebook, where we have tons and tons of teams that manage tons and tons of different systems, the ability to safely give them the ability to make the changes they want to make means that we can manage a huge, huge number of different systems w with a tiny, tiny team. Uh, full programming languages, awesome. Uh, it turns out that if you want to manipulate data structures, having, I don't know, say loops, kind of useful. Um, one of our biggest biggest problems with CF Engine 2 was that you don't have a programming language. I can't do, I can sort of do conditionals in weird, wonky ways, but I can't do a loop. Um, scale is more than just number of clients. People love to talk about how many clients can connect to whatever it is that they're, whatever service they wrote. Um, I got in a, a, a large argument with a CF Engine 2 proponent a couple years ago, and his only argument was the massive number of clients that could connect to his CF serve D. Um, 
every uh, uh, ah, easily easy abstractions are super critical, not just for your delegation but for your own um, sanity, right? If you don't have easy abstractions, then when you change how something under the hood works, you now have a lot of places to change that code. But if you have abstractions and you can change that abstraction, you don't have to change it anywhere except that one place. Uh, testing against real systems is useful and necessary, and I know some of you out there are going, that's super crazy, why would I want to change a production system? And the reality of it is you may have your own QA and your own test, and you may want to go through that first, and I highly encourage you to do so. But at the end of the day, the only test that actually proves it's going to work in production is when you actually put it into production. So testing on a real production host or a subset of real production hosts needs to be the final test, because otherwise your test was only a partial test. So in summary, we asked a bunch of questions at the beginning of the talk. I don't see how we measure up to that. How many homogenous systems can we maintain with the system we built? Well, we don't have homogenous systems at Facebook. Every system um, is part of a group, and that group is always a special snowflake. And so we know that we can manage m at least, well, we know we can manage more than 70,000 heterogeneous systems. And since that problem should be a smaller problem space, we can manage way more than 17,000, and we don't know how many. And for the number of heterogeneous systems we can maintain, we've proved that we can maintain well more than 17,000, just on one chef infrastructure. How many people are needed? Well, the team that I work on is four people. And can you safely delegate, delegate configuration? Yeah. Uh, we've shown time and time again how easy it is with the system to delegate Delta configuration to other people. I want to thank a bunch of people. Um, OpsCode is an amazing company. Uh, in particular, I want to thank Adam, who is the uh, CTO and who is the original author of Chef. He was our advocate for pushing all of this stuff into open source super aggressively, um, which I think is makes them just an awesome and wonderful company. Um, I want to thank Chris Brown, who I've pissed off many times. He's their VP of engineering. Um, so my, my love and respect to Chris. Uh, Stephen Dana, um, who is one of their support guys, who is above and, above and beyond just an, an incredibly awesome engineer and uh, who has done a lot of work for, for Facebook, um, and also who has written some really cool, nice plugins you should go check out. Um, the entire Earthchef team, who took a pretty complicated system and rewrote it from scratch in a new programming, la programming language, and as far as I can tell, had zero regressions. It's kind of awesome. Uh, I want to thank Andrew Crump, who wrote a tool called Food Critic. Uh, if we didn't have a tool to automatically test for basic chef correctness, um, delegating Delta configuration would be a lot scarier than it is. So, like, awesome tool. Uh, everyone on my team, uh, Casey and Larry and, and Ender, who sadly couldn't be here, um, as well as other people I work with, uh, managers Pedro and Bethany. And with that, I will gladly take questions after I drink some water. <laughs> yeah, what's up? Totally. Uh, so I'm going to preface it. So the question was, how do we manage deployments? Uh, in particular, deployments where we want to do partial rollouts and or manage dependencies on, on different subsets of systems. And it's a perfectly valid question. Um, however, I need to throw out the disclaimer that we do not use Chef for application deployments. Um, we have built specific tools to the way Facebook works to actually roll out our, um, our application. And we use Chef specifically for system level configuration. Um, so I'm giving you that disclaimer. Um, however, I will try and answer your question. Uh, so the reality of it is um, you can gate things on all sorts of stuff in, in, in Chef. So we often, one of the things that we wrote was a system called sharding. And internally we do some consistent hashing. And every system at Facebook can calculate what shard it's in. So we will often check in a change that says do this if and only if you're in shard 1 or shard 2 or shard 3. Um, and what that means is you're in the bottom 1% or 2% or 3% or 4% or 5%. Um, and so if you do it in shard 5, um, what that means is you're in shards 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5. And so we use that to, to roll out. Like if we think something's super crazy, we'll roll it out slowly. Um, and we use sharding all over the place. We use sharding both in, C in, in Chef and in CF Engine and other places. Um, and I highly recommend that, that you, you do this, especially if you have a large infrastructure, um, because people don't like it when you take down the website. Uh, additionally, with regards to dependencies on different tiers, um, we just do that really simply with multiple diffs. You check in the dependencies, you roll that out. Once the dependency is there, you check in the next step. So, yeah? Um, you mentioned that you can deploy an application in a different language. <coughs> so let's say it's a code group, mm -hmm. and a specific test that you need to get rid of that. Mm -hmm. How do you approve that? Like, do you have any knowledge for each other, or how do you do this? Do you discover each other? 
totally. Uh, so the question was, uh, we push 15 minutes every 15 minutes, uh, and that sounds really scary. How do you how do you roll back? How do you detect problems? Uh, so <coughs> we detect problems because we have a uh, well, multiple things. One, it's when you're checking in a change, it's your responsibility to watch that change and make sure it goes out well. Um, you roll back usually by just reverting your diff and committing that in. Um, but also we have a copious amount of monitoring. Um, we have alert-based monitoring around Chef. Every team has alert-based monitoring around their application. We have an entire team that is uh, that watches the site in general and knows about how the site's supposed to be working. Um, and they have a very good idea of how the systems work together and can escalate to the right teams. Um, so in general, the way you're going to roll back is by reverting your def. Um, that said, the same disclaimer ha um, uh, I'm going to throw out from the first question, which is we don't do app deployment this way. We have an entire team that very, very carefully manages the twice a day app pushes um, and pushes out to very, very small subsets of systems and grows and grows and grows and can roll back. Um, but for, for non-application deployment, um, we, we often just roll out to percentages of machines for anything that's scary um, and grow slowly. Yeah, what's up? What's the wish list? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, so what's the wish list? Well, at the moment, uh, we are building a lot of tools um, around Chef. Um, and so Larry, who's here in the front, um, is currently building, uh, we have, I, I mentioned that we have these report handlers that shove all of this data into monitoring. And that's all well and good when the Chef team gets an alert that like nobody's running Chef anymore cause, because one of us checked in some core configuration that like breaks Chef. Uh, but it doesn't really help you if you're checking in a change that's specific to the database servers or the web servers, um, especially if it's a small tier. Uh, like the overall graph of a, of a you know, uh, 15,000 nodes in a cluster, we're not going to notice. Uh, so what we're doing is we're, um, w we've, we've started shoving more and more data into our central monitoring system. And Larry's actually building a tool where as a service owner, you will get alerts that are specific to your tier of systems so that if you check in a change and you're not paying attention, you will get a notification that, dude, uh, the number of resources on all of your boxes went up and stayed up. You did something wrong. Or chef stopped running on your boxes. Or you're getting a whole lot of exceptions or whatever. So the wish list there is building monitoring. Um, from a, so that's sort of on our side. Um, I do wish that, um, and, and, and Larry and Casey can actually talk about this in probably more detail. Um, there have definitely been cases where we kind of wish that some of the, there were some tools that would um, allow aggregating the stuff a little bit better without having to do it ourselves. Um, at a cluster level that we can then aggregate. Um, and in fact, Opscode is working on those things. Um, it's not clear w what side of, of private versus open source chef that'll fall on. Um, but generally speaking, um, we, uh, um, w the wish list that we have internally is mostly around the tools we want to build on top of chef and not chef itself. So yeah, Phil? Um, so the question there is Chef over Puppet, um, and I kind of had a feeling this would come up. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preface this by saying there are different tools for different jobs, and uh, while I will talk about why I like Chef, that does not mean that uh, Puppet sucks or that Puppet is never the right solution. So that said, um, the reason I would say the biggest reason that 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 the biggest reasons that we picked um, Chef over Puppet was one that first case study we looked at with syscontrols. The ability for us to set up a bunch of defaults early on in the run and then have everyone else tweak that in a nice way and then generate that file later was actually really, really difficult in Puppet. It took, I think, I think the, the class that we ended up writing was like a couple hundred lines. It was non-trivial. Um, to which many Puppet people say, well, you're doing it wrong, don't use templates. And I get it, like, I do, but this was the workflow we needed. Um, and, and Puppet just didn't meet that workflow. And it doesn't mean it sucks, it means it doesn't meet our workflow. And that's what this talk is all about, right, is understanding your workflow and your scalability. So that was one of them. Uh, the other one was um, the ability to, um, to tweak the internal assumptions that I was talking about. Um, at the time, Puppet didn't have uh, the ability to use Ruby from within Manifest. Um, and they have since gotten that. Um, and I don't know how good or bad it is, because we were well down this path, and so th th we didn't look at it. Um, but at the time, Ruby only, or sorry, uh, Puppet only had its very, very limited DSL, which meant that it actually caused us many of the same problems that CF Engine 2 did. No offense to Puppet people. Um, so we just had 
so many limitations and restrictions about being flexible and how you would munge data because there was a restrictive DSL and you didn't have the full power of Ruby to just be like, you know what, I'm going to update this hash. And an example of that is if you have a class and you pass in data to it and, and, and pop it, uh, it was read-only. Like, you can assign, uh, that, that's a slight misstatement, but you can only assign values once. And so once you assign them, like, too bad, you can't change them. And, and so what you end up doing is like, OK, so if somebody passed in something, then assign that. But if not, then assign this other thing. And it was just really cumbersome. Um, so you can do it. It's just way more cumbersome. Um, so for the specific use cases we were looking at, Puppet was just going to be way more cumbersome than Shuffle. So what about like, the Ruby hash on the stuff that you still left? Uh, so that's only the server that spits out cookbooks. The actual client is still in Ruby um, and will, min will continue to be in Ruby. We have five per cluster. So three front ends and two back ends. That picture was not an abstraction. That picture was absolutely how our clusters look. Yeah? Uh, I have a question about the source component uh, potentially. You say that um, uh, some of these abstractions are from other views. Mm -hmm. uh, do you, by testing, do you actually mean most of where the root branch or test it anywhere? Uh, we do everything on head. Everything on head. <laughs> so, uh, so there's a subversion repo. And when you push to subversion, it's committed. There, we don't do release branches, at least not for, um, at least not specifically for the, what we call the ops files is repo. Is, is it touching the event branch or anything? Any nope. So, so the way we manage that is, uh, is, is if you if you're doing local work, uh, we as I said, we wrap that in Git. So you'll commit that to Git and body body blah, blah, and when you're ready, you do Git SVN decommit, and so that pushes it up to subversion. The moment it hits subversion, it's committed. That's it. There's no branches. Uh, we have a repo for all operations-y stuff. Correct. You have a Git local Git repo, which you can make as many changes as you want and, and flip around branches and do all your magic stuff. Uh, and then once it's code reviewed, the, the, the gate is in a subversion pre-commit hook. And it says, hey, let me go look at the uh, code review system. Did someone code review this? Yes. No. Does that answer your question? Correct. Okay, yeah, what's up? Why are you using Git as the base? It's a great question. Um, because because the subversion repos were set up, you know, ten years ago when the company started, um, and we're looking at changing it. And in fact, we we will change it, um, and we'll actually change it to Mercurial and not Git for a variety of reasons I won't go into here. Um, <laughs> but what happened is uh, you have a bunch of engineers who don't like the subversion workflow, <coughs> and so they run Git SVN. Right, and so that's just a, something that organically happened. Totally, there are Mercurial SVN bridges, bridges that you can use, and we have. And in fact, that's that's one of the ways that we will end up managing that transition. Exactly, and hopefully we'll get rid of subversion one day. Really, yeah. What's up? No, no, no. So in this case with Chef, it's a manual test. You run Chef test. I want to pick web server, you know, 5,672 in this in this cluster, and it goes to that box and it ties it to your org, and then you log in and you run Chef client, and you look at the logs and you say yes, this did what I wanted, or no, it didn't, and then you have to take that evidence and shove it in um, uh, commit message, um, which is not really a commit message yet, um, which gets uploaded to the code review system, and people can look at that test plan and say, dude, that was not a test. Try again. Or awesome, thanks. Uh, that's a fuzzy question. Um, <laughs> so, um, so I'm going to restate your question in a way that I think is what you're asking, just to make sure I answer that question. Uh, you're asking about the case where I test on a box, I'm testing thing A, and in the process broke thing B? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, um, Chef has a really interesting, unique feature. Uh, that if it can't do something, uh, it stops. Uh, CF Engine is the opposite problem. It will continue on and then be like, I fulfilled 82% of your promises. And you're like, I don't know what the fuck that means. Um, <laughs> Chef's like, dude, you want a system, and I can't give you that system. And also, you gave me an order in which to do things. And if I can't do this one, I don't know it's safe to do the next one. So I'm just going to stop. And that's actually something that some people don't like, but is super, super useful. 
um, in our opinion, because it means that you're not going to accidentally do something that's dangerous later, and because I can monitor that shit and go, something went wrong, uh, as opposed to like trying to grep out things from logs. Uh, so the, in the vast majority of cases, what's going to happen is your chef run is going to break because you've changed some data that's not going to allow things to continue. Um, also, because our app, app deployment works in a very different way, you're very unlikely to break the app. Um, you could possibly change performance on that app, but again, we've managed whether the app, we, we monitor whether the app is up, we monitor what the performance of that app is, and so more than likely you're going to get an alert, it's going to get pulled out of the load balancer, et cetera, et cetera. Good monitoring solves a huge number of problems. <laughs> yeah, what's up? Uh, we, uh, so, so no, but, um, well, actually, yes. Um, but the disclaimer here is that uh, as a proof of concept, uh, the four guys on my team, in including myself, uh, did the web servers, which is our biggest here. And so we kind of went off in a corner and we're like, we're just going to take this because you can't, it's hard to convince a bunch of people to move unless you can prove it scales and that it'll do what they want. Uh, so the <coughs> in that, we were trying to build delegation and be like, okay, well, if we had done this, what would other people be able to do? And now we're pushing that, that out and we've probably got another 10 or 15 small tiers that have converted, and the next two or three big tiers are, are sort of in progress. Uh, and and in the process of that, we've learned a lot of lessons. Um, and one of the lessons we learned was that our monitoring wasn't sufficient for small tiers. If you have 10 boxes and a cluster of 10,000, like the monitoring is just not gonna catch you. Because um, we have a fair amount of noise, right, from machines that are dying. Um, and so that gets into the tool that I said Larry was writing, where you go along and you're like, I'm a service owner, I've moved my box to chef, and so if all of a sudden something weird happens specifically on my tier, um, I want to get notified. Um, and so we've had that happen once or twice, um, but fortunately it was as people were migrating, and so they noticed it right away. They were like, dude, my stuff's not working anymore. Um, and so we realized that that's fine when you're migrating because you're constantly looking, but as soon as you're just migrating from CF Engine to chef, that's not going to fly. It's got to be push-based monitoring. Um, which is why we're building that tool. Um, we've got all the, the data now being pushed through report handlers, um, and we're just working on the final bits of that tool. Hmm? Yeah. Uh, I'll take one more question if there are, and if not, then we'll be done. I thought I saw a hand in the back. Nope. All right, guys, thanks so much.